Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore U. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, just by hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell to see our weekly videos. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. This is made possible by our sponsor, sponsors, OWC. For more information on how you can assist, uh, they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. Now, this week, I'm joined by sound designer Woody Woodhall, whose work has includes, he's worked for Netflix, Amazon, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube Red, uh, CBS. He's also written a book, audio production and post-production for college and universities. And of course, he heads up the LAPPG as um, among many, many other things. Welcome to the show, Woody. Hey, well, thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Now, you worked on one of my favorite docs, which is the best worst movie. Best worst movie. You know, people bring that up a lot. Yeah. Well, had you seen Troll 2 before? You know, I didn't know anything about it. I got a call from Michael, the director. Um, this was probably about a dozen years ago now. And, um, you know, when we spoke and he said, how's the process work, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, send me a, a copy of it. And I watched it. It was uncolored. It was unmixed, you know, like typical when you're bidding on a project. And um, I just remember thinking, wow. And I, I, when I called him to talk to him about it, I said, who's seen this? And he said, oh, nobody, just me and the editors and, uh, you know, not, not a lot of people. And uh, I said, wow, you're just sitting on a gold mine here. This thing is just really wonderful. It's just, you know, it's a movie about movies and it's a movie about people. And it's just, it's a great documentary. It's just got like everything in it. And, uh, and then, of course, I was absolutely fascinated. I've got to see this movie, Troll 2. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you have, do you like watching bad good movies or good bad movies <laughs> i yeah you know i i'm you know covid sort of put us all in some weird hibernative state and um so yeah i mean i think we watched all of net netflix and all of amazon prime in you know in the course of of all of this and still do um so yeah i do i i, I like uh, i like it just about everything you know, and I've been fortunate in my career to, to be able to work on a lot of different types of things. So I do feature docs and I do feature films and I've done lots of television and I've done, you know, serious uh, shows. Like I just did a series for um, Discovery Network called Cal Fire about the fires here in Northern California. Just got a telly for one of the episodes. It's just a heartbreaking episode of Marin County and just the devastation that the fires did. Um, so I've had that, but then I've also done, um, you know, I did mystery diners for uh, Food Network. I think I did 160 of them. I did uh, storage hunters for True TV. So I've done, you know, those kinds of uh, shows as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to be able to, to, to have that opportunity. And, uh, and fortunately, I like, I like all of it. Well, and I mean, like even looking at your bio, it's like, <laughs> I think it said you've worked from podcast to feature films and everything in between. Um, and I'm doing all of, all of them right now. I'm doing a podcast right now on Alzheimer's. I'm doing these short bits for the Recording Academy uh, with uh, musical artists talking about their riders, uh, their backstage riders. So those are two minute uh, videos for uh, the Recording Academy. You can see those on YouTube. Um, I've got a feature film coming out uh, very soon starring Minu Savari and um, Urkel. And, uh, and then I've got a bunch of feature docs, uh, some of which are out now and uh, some that uh, I'm still working on. So, yeah, I've been lucky. And, and just a point of uh, information, uh, not a big deal, but you said that I worked for Amazon Netflix. I, I did not work for any of them, but uh, a all of the programming that I've done, or a lot of programming I've done, has been on all of those uh, streaming platforms. Or yeah, no, it's fine. Now, when it, I guess, well, I have questions on a bunch of things you said there, but I do want to know whenever someone comes in because I've I've seen this with podcasts. Whenever I've talked to people who are producing them, they want to get the NPR sound. <laughs> do you get asked that whenever people come in, or is there a particular? 
sound that they want? <clears throat> well, uh, you know, and not specifically that, although I'm a big fan of NPR. I, I think across the board, though, when it comes to audio, is everybody wants sort of whatever they think that pristine sound is. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the times, um, they're not recorded that way. And one of the things I talk about when I teach, I just did a thing last week for the Creativity Conference with Maxim, uh, I don't know if you know him, but uh, it was a wonderful event. And um, the, what I, you know, I had a 20 minute spot and really what I talked about was listening. Uh, because that's really what it comes down to, and I think that's going to make you a better filmmaker, it's going to make your sound for your show better, is you really need to learn to listen, because, you know, uh, humans have such a fantastic uh, capacity uh, to block, and uh, so we don't hear things. We, we have this innate sense of focus, uh, which is wonderful, and a camera is great for that, right? A camera can zoom in and, and put all the uh, distractions aside, but a microphone just doesn't work that way. No matter how directional a microphone is, it's going to pick up the hum of the refrigerator, it's going to pick up the air conditioning, it's going to, all of those things, and we are so used to not hearing those things in our lives that, uh, you know, the, I think one of the greatest skills for audio for a filmmaker is to learn how to hear, really listen to what's going on, and the, you know, the best filmmakers do. Um, you know, I've heard stories about, you um, um, David Stone, who's a wonderful um, supervising sounder, he's a teacher now, but he did, um, he was talking about, I think it was one of the Star Trek movies, I interviewed him for a blog uh, years ago, and he was saying how the director had asked him um, about the sound, and he said, well, actually, there's an issue because of the flooring uh, made some, you know, horrible sound, and so they actually spent, you know, a good amount of time fixing that because he knew that once he got to post I mean and this is what I always tell my clients you can keep kicking the can down the road but I'm the end of the line so you've kicked the can as far as it'll go now we have to deal with it you have this these audio issues and and let's deal with it and and one of the things I think that um, particularly newer filmmakers or people who, who, who may be less experienced um, they don't realize that people like me and my team you know, we do this every day, so we have a lot of experience in a lot of different um, situations, and so really, a, a lot of things can be alleviated right from the beginning, and I always encourage, and certainly um, clients of mine who, who are, you know, who have come back and, and I've worked with now for, you know, a decade or more, uh, they'll call me before they shoot and say, hey, I got some considerations here, you know, we're, we're going to be doing this, that, and the other thing, and um, you know, I, I'm not here to scold anybody. I'm not here to tell anybody how they should be doing things. But I do want them to be aware that at some point it's going to cost time and money, um, whether it's on the set or whether it's when you get to me. And uh, I think it's always better to, to deal with it uh, as much as you can because there's going to be so many unseen factors anyway <laughs> in making a project um, that are going to mess you up that you just didn't even realize until you get to post uh, so you might as well do the very best that you can every step of the way because all that other stuff is inevitable anyway. Now, you mentioned your feature that you just finished. Or yes. You're in the process of finishing. Correct. So what were some of the challenges that, as a sound designer, you didn't realize moving into directing? Uh, oh, uh, no, I didn't direct a feature. This is th No, no, this is something I posed. I did actually, um, I do, I should say, have a project now that I wrote and directed. Uh, it's a presentation pilot for a television series. And, uh, and that's moving through the festival circuit right now. I just won Best Director at the Seattle Film Festival. And uh, I've won a couple of things. So, um, yeah, that was a, a different experience for me. Um, it's called Contact High. And it's about aliens coming for our weed. <laughs> so, um, one of the things about the... Um, um, the virus and all of that was I just, you know, I just thought it's time for some silly comedy. And, uh, you know, I have a very supportive partner and wife. And uh, so I went ahead and, and wrote this uh, thing. And um, 
I, I don't think the sound, uh, as a director on that project, I don't think the sound was an issue for me. I had a pretty good sense. I hired really good people that I've known and worked with in the past, and um, my team did the sound with me, so you know, we just approached it like every project that we did, that we've done in the past. Um, I think just as a director, I think the thing that... Um, that gets every director, as I just had said, no matter what you plan for, once you get all those little pieces into post, you're like, mm, okay, that didn't work. So now, how am I going to sell this? Or, you know, hey, I left off this bit. Now, I think part of part of the uh, bonus of my experience in, in sound was that some of the parts of the story that I felt weren't told well, I was able to you know, use ADR and, and things like that in sound to help push along the story. So that was useful. Now, when you work with a director, how do you get on the same pay, uh, page of what they're wanting sound sound design wise um, and making sure you understand auditorily what they mean? Sure. Uh, well, every situation is different. Every project is different. Every filmmaker is different. So uh, there's there's a lot there. Um, it, it all starts with um, the original bid, really. I'll watch the show, um, and and I'll have a whole lot of feelings about things that I think can help them tell their story. Because at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, I feel like my my job is to really help tell that the story that they're they're trying to convey, and and how can I help them in sound tell that story? Um, so. You know, after my initial viewing, um, typically we'll be on the same page because they'll say, you know, they may have a couple of things. It de you know, it really depends on the project and, and, and the type of person they are. But, you know, let's say that they have a really dry scene and they're just like, you know, I need something in there. That's I don't want music there, but it's just two people in a room. What can we do? You know, those kinds of things. So you have those conversations. Unfortunately, um, a good amount of the conversations end up being about what we can fix because of going back to that idea of learning to listen. Um, you know, they may not have hired a professional sound crew or um, they might have been really pushed and they just didn't have the time. Uh, or they may not have listened to their sound person who said to them, you know, I keep hearing airplanes or, or you know, I keep hearing traffic or I hear a refrigerator or I hear AC. Um, and so a lot of times it, it becomes, hey, man, can we fix this? Can we change this scene? How can we make this sound better? Um, which, you know, of course, is part of the job, and, and I'm happy to do that. But um, it does sort of take away from um, what I can offer on a creative side. So anyway, to, to get back to your question specifically, um, once we've been through that process, we call it the spotting process, and we, we sort of go through the whole film. You know, and now I've gotten the job. We go through the whole film sort of scene by scene, and we talk about each scene. Um, and then usually I'm just sort of left to my own devices. They figure, hey, this guy's been doing this for a while. Um, just have at it. And then at that point, um, you know, I have a lot of uh, my own approaches and my own thoughts on how I like to do stuff and, and how my team works. And then, um, you know, I think the, the, the um, anxiety comes usually when I'm presenting that first mix pass um, because I don't know if, you know, they might say, whoa, that's a little over the top or I love that or, or whatever. So in my experience, what I try to do is I try to put in uh, everything. You know, I basically my uh, approach with, with my sound editors is if you see it, we hear it. Uh, I, I may mute, mute it all, I might mix it all down, I might blend it in such a way that it's hard to even hear, uh, but it has that sort of uh, texture in the, in the mix. Um, and then it's really up to the client to say, oh, no, you know, I don't really want all that, those crowds there. Or, hey, I love those crowds, let's bring those up. Um, and then working on a television show, it, it's different. When I'm working on a film or when I'm working on a, uh, a documentary, um, you know, those filmmakers ha have been, you know, working on this thing for a while and they have some strong thoughts about it. And television, and I've done a lot of series, 
is a um, is sort of a pre-digested thing. It has to go through so many hands and so many decisions, whether it's the production company, whether it's the network, whether it's uh, you know uh, the uh, distribution or whatever. Um, and so by the time I get the edit, it's got the music in it, it's got the whoosh sound effects, all of those things may have already been chosen. And so really for me, it's just how do I fulfill the quality control requirements? You know, they're going to say they want the splits to be this particular thing. So I need to make sure, you know, and I need to have whatever the specs are uh, in terms of the... Um, amplitude and um, the, you know something called the LKFS which is a, one of the deliverables you know that's much more common nowadays um, and and I just try to make the best sounding show and typically in, in over the years what I found with uh, working on television is and it's typically not a director at that point it's typically an executive producer who will come into the bay with me um, it really usually comes down to the music <laughs> it's either I need that music hot, man. It's just it's too low. I can't hear it. Or, oh my God, that music is so hot and I can't hear any of the dialogue. And so usually that first review, uh, if I have not worked with them before, um, I'll know right away. Okay. The, every episode from now on, we're slamming that music. We're slamming the effects. Or, you know, every episode from now on, all that music's getting buried. And, <laughs> you know, just sort of move on. Now, you did... One thing that it, one of my favorite things about sound and working in sound with people is the communication between people. And that is because you will be in a room with adults and they'll be like, no, it's more like this, click, click, click. And they all start doing their weird sounds. And uh, so just one of my favorite things is doing that. Um, now, like to sort of extrapolate on that, it is such a team sport in sound. And as the supervising sound designer, or sound editor, how do you like to work with your team to get uh, the best out of them? Um, well, it, you know, it, I've been fortunate that, um, you know, some of the people that I'm working with now have, have been with me for a while. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unwritten at this point. I just sort of throw it at them and tell them, you know, what I need done. Um, but as I said, uh, my approach is, you know, once you get into the bay with uh, the filmmaker, the director, the EP, or whoever it is, you know, you need to have your gun loaded, basically. Um, and because you don't want to be in a situation where you don't have an option for them readily available, or you're digging through sound effects while, you know, there's a team of people sitting in a bay behind you. So what I like to do is I like to have my team create options for me. So if, if we're, say, creating the sound effects for um, graphics um, that haven't been chosen at that point, um, you know, I'll ask my team to put three different types of sounds in there. I'll end up choosing what I think is best and mixing what I think is best. But then I've got another option right there. If they're like, you know, I'm not crazy about that sound. It's a little too bassy or whatever it is. I, I can immediately just mute and unmute something else. And um, like I said, my approach is basically if you see it, uh, put it in. So we put in everything as if, um, as if we're doing a feature film delivery. It doesn't matter what it is. Whether and we typically don't do it for podcasts because of the deliverables, but anything that's going to have a set of splits, um, you know, we'll put in cloth, we'll put in body pads, we'll put in footsteps. Um, I like to think in layers. Again, that's one of the things I talk about when I e express to people that they need to learn to listen, is that life happens in layers. Life isn't just one looped background, and and you get that a lot where you'll get um, you know a temp edit or something where they take a two minute or a 20 second piece really and they just sort of loop it throughout the scene and they say gee this doesn't really work and it's because um you know life isn't like that there's traffic and there's wind and there's people talking and there's birds and there's a dog um so you know um over over the years and discussions that I've had with the people that work with me, I always express to them, you know, let, let's find a way to fill this out. And then when I'm in the bay, 
the client might say to me, oh, that dog is really distracting. Could you just remove that? And I could just remove it. Or if they're like, gee, there's a dead spot there. Is there anything we can put in there? Maybe a dog? And I've got it. Boom. I just bring it right up. So um, so really, I just tell I just tell everybody who works with me uh, to sort of fill up the show. And as I'm mixing the show, at that point, I'll just see all of the elements that I have. And then I have the opportunity. And particularly if we've been working in layers... Um, because on you know there's layers of layers. There's even if let's just say you have a simple car pass, you know it's not just the sound effect of a car passing. I also ask them to please put in the sound of the motor accelerating. I ask them to put in the sound of squeaky brakes if they're decelerating. I ask them to put in the sound of tires on the road. Uh, there might be a little gravel or a little bit of grit or something. So just that one car pass might have four or five layers. And then um, I've got the options there so that I can bring down the motor noise because we're really kind of focused on the tire and bring up the sound of the tire on the road. Or um, And so having layers like that and, and, and asking my team to build my shows in layers allows me that opportunity as the mixer now um, to, to sort of really mimic what I'm looking at on, on screen. Is there a scene or a moment in your career that you're most proud of the sound design that you've created and what was it and why? Um, you know, I'm not I'm not kind of a a best of kind of guy. You know, people say, What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite actor? Yeah, you know, I'm not I, I don't things like that don't readily come to my mind because I'm just not built that way. Um so instead let me answer it like this, you know, it's usually um the things that are most recent, <laughs> right? So um, I just recently did a feature doc on the electronic artist Moby, um, and um, and that was a really fun project to work on. It, the director Rob Bralver is a, uh, just a fantastic uh, picture editor, and there were just these montages and these scenes and. Um, and Moby was really cool. We, when we talked about the show, um, you know, he asked me what my approach was. I said, you know, just what I told you, we, we sort of put it all in. Um, and, and his directive was basically, have at it, do what you want. And so that was a, a sort of a nerve wracking thing because here I, you know, I have this, you know, um, international star um you know i own his music i'm a fan of his music so i wanted to make sure i did did well um you know it got uh, theatrical release um so there was that and then it, you know it's streaming now so i knew that it would get some attention um and and i wanted to please him i wanted him to, to i wanted him to see that i was um adding to his visuals and uh, so anyway, it came out in the spring of this year, and right then there was a little bit of a lull with uh, COVID, and so it had a theatrical run, and it played here in town at a, a theater called The New Art, which is a wonderful, uh, I saw a Best Worst movie there, in fact, many years ago with George Hardy and uh, with uh, Michael Paul Stevenson, and, um, but, um, so I got to see the film uh, in a theater. Uh, you know, we were wearing masks and, you know, there, frankly, there weren't very many people there because I think everybody was really gun shy about leaving the house at, even at that point. Um, but, you know, there's just these montages and scenes where he goes into outer space and... Um, um, you know, we got to, he gave me the multi-tracks of his score. So I got to remix some of that stuff for the theater and, uh, and just sitting there, uh, and, you know, and also, uh, having not left the house for probably, you know, 13 or 14 months, honestly, um, and sitting in a movie theater and hearing a show that I delivered and, um, that was a really gratifying moment and there was you know there was a, a stretch in there um where he he does a spot with david bowie and then david lynch is in there because um he and david lynch are very close so there's a lot of interviews with david lynch and there's just this it's he calls it a surrealistic uh biopic something along those lines and um and it really is and because of that i got to do 
just so much fun stuff with with not only with the sound design but also with his music in parts and so just sitting in the theater that was a, just a really a great um a great moment so now i have one last question that i like to ask everyone on these zoom calls um because we've been stuck in this pandemic for a year and a half maybe more now um a lot of people have turned to streaming you you alluded to that earlier um so what I ask people is, have you discovered anything on the streaming networks or the streaming ser uh, services that you think people should check out while they're stuck at home? Um, you know, I nothing particularly stands out. There was a, a show that we watched called Atypical uh, that we really enjoyed. Um, I think at that point, though, we had sort of, um, you know, run out of things. Uh, because we just felt like we watched it all. And, um, you know, one one of the things that was just really fun for my wife and I is our daughter is a teenager now, and she's she's at a point where, you know, she can pretty much watch everything. You know, there was a time where, like, oh, well, that's kind of got some questionable scenes, and we're sort of over that at this, at this point with her. And so um, we've been watching, really binge-watching, Stuff that we've already seen, my wife and I have already seen, uh, like, for, for instance, Lost, which, um, you know, seeing that now in a compressed way, uh, right now we're also watching Silicon Valley from beginning to end, you know, uh, and I'm watching, I'm rewatching Game of Thrones, you know, these shows which were done over the period of years so sometimes at the end of the season you know they'd say be back next year in the summer and you're like what i gotta wait eight nine months now and to see these shows uh with my daughter now shows that we really liked um but now compressed and you can sort of follow the story in a much clearer way and really understand um you know uh how good they were as filmmakers so uh, nothing earth shattering out there just there's just so much great content nowadays we're oh, just really crazy. lucky aren't we it's yeah. like it's an embarrassment of riches it's so exactly it is and, and the worst part is, is you sit there and you're like i have nothing to watch <laughs> isn't it crazy you, you go through amazon hulu prime apple tv and you're just <laughs> you know i sort of liken it to the days when we there used to be blockbuster uh, and there used to be, you know, table, you know, you, you would get there and there'd be just shelves and shelves of, of titles. And so now instead of having to leave the comfort of your house, you're just seeing the same thing, but you're just seeing it on a screen as opposed to walking through a store and, and, and getting an empty box. So, well, thank you so much for letting me interview you. Um, and that's it for this week. Uh, make sure to check out FilmmakerU.com for our latest courses and follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore you and on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell to get notified for our weekly videos. And again, I want to thank you, Woody, for joining us. And of course, our sponsors, OWC, go to OWCdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching. <laughs>